Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Danielle. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about reservoir rocks. Uh, we're doing a couple of uh, lectures on the uh, main play elements. Uh, this is a cartoon I showed in uh, lecture two or three. Uh, the five main play elements are source, hydrocarbon migration, reservoir rocks, traps, and seal. And last uh, session we talked about source rocks, and today we'll talk about reservoir rocks. Uh, I'll talk mostly about conventional reservoirs, but I have uh, several slides on unconventional reservoirs or what are also referred to as resource plays. I showed this uh, last time in the uh, source um, lecture. Uh, we have four essential elements. We need source rocks, we need reservoir quality rocks, we need a good sealing lithology, and then we need overburden so that the uh, the rocks are buried uh, so that hydrocarbons can get generated. And then we have two main processes that we worry about. One is uh, trap formation, and the others are related to hydrocarbon. It's uh, generation, hydrocarbon migration, and then hydrocarbon accumulation. So a reservoir is a rock that uh, allows oil and gas to be extracted from it uh, using wells. Uh, and we're able to bring the oil or the gas or the condensate up to the surface. What a reservoir quality rock has to have is uh, two uh, main characteristic. It needs void space in the rock for the hydrocarbon molecules to occupy, and we call that porosity. And that'll go from 0% uh, up to uh, about 35, maybe 40% in uh, recent sediments. And then we need sufficient plumbing so that the hydrocarbon molecules can escape or get out of the rock uh, up through the pipe and to the surface. And that uh, plumbing uh, is what we refer to as permeability. I'll have a little bit more um, detailed explanations or definitions coming up. So porosity, uh, it's commonly symbolized by the Greek uh, phi. Uh, it's a measure of the void or empty spaces in a material and it's a fraction of the volume of the voids over the total rock volume. So there's a couple of pictures here. Uh, the brown uh, circles are meant to be uh, grains of sediment, say sand. The white in between it is the pore space or where we would uh, be able to have fluids collect. So that would be the porosity. Uh, the other thing we can have is we can have fracture porosity uh, if the rocks are either naturally fractured or if they are stimulated by man to uh, frack the rocks and allow hydrocarbons to escape. Permeability, it's commonly represented by the K or the kappa. Uh, it's a measure of the ability of a porous material, uh, often rocks or unconsolidated uh, uh, grains, to allow the flow of fluids through it. So uh, in the diagram on the far left, we see there's no pore space and there's no porosity. So this would, be, would not be a, a rock that we could use to get uh, hydrocarbons out of. Uh, in the middle, we have uh, pores. The blue is showing up as the uh, pore space where hydrocarbons can uh, collect, uh, but it's not connected, so it's a, a low uh, permeability. And then on the right, this would be a reservoir quality rock where we have both pores and the connections in between the pores are open, so we have a higher permeability. So permeability and porosity are the two most important characteristics of a reservoir, and these uh, characteristics are studied quite intensely by people who are trying to assess uh, where to drill and where a field might be and then once a, a discovery is made, how the field will produce oil or gas uh, as we drill wells into it. There's um, two main types of reservoirs. There's conventional reservoirs uh, on the left. Those can be made of clastic rocks, uh, sands and uh, conglomerates, uh, or uh, certain types of carbonates. We use uh, traditional methods to extract hydrocarbons out of these types of rocks where we have uh, relatively high porosity, relatively high permeability. The other type of reservoirs are 
um, uh, were not uh, uh, exploited for uh, about uh, until about 12 years ago. Uh, they are unconventional reservoirs. Uh, these would be tight oil sands, tight gas sands, uh, shale oil or shale gas, and coal bed methane. And we use uh, newly developed methods to try to extract the hydrocarbons from these rocks that have uh, much lower porosity and much lower permeability. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about both conventional reservoirs and unconventional reservoirs in the next series of slides. So with a conventional reservoir, we'll first uh, look at the clastic, uh, and that's where we're talking about uh, sands and gravels and cobbles. Um, and we have different uh, environments where we can get good reservoir quality clastic reservoirs, uh, alluvial fans, aeolian dunes, fluvial rocks, shoreline deposits, delta deposits, and out in the deep water. So we'll look at these uh, six different uh, types of deposits uh, going from uh, uh, way up dip in a depositional system to uh, the deep basin. So alluvial fans, uh, these are fan or cone-shaped deposits that are built up by streams that crisscross uh, uh, across them. Uh, there'll be a single apex, uh, such as a uh, canyon or a valley within mountains. Uh, often there's a fault scarp associated with where these, uh, these uh, canyons are uh, located. And uh, they'll build up uh, huge deposits, uh, usually of uh, fairly coarse grain, uh, not rounded uh, and not all that well sorted, uh, although the sorting can be uh, uh, fair to moderate. Aeolian dunes, uh, a dune is a hill of sand. It is uh, built up by sand grains that are interacting either with wind or water flow. Um, most dunes have a long slope um, on the um, uh, windward uh, side and sand is pushed up the, um, uh, the uh, long side and then the sand cascades down the uh, uh, downwind direction side. And these can uh, form dune fields uh, and places like uh, the Sahara Desert are known uh, for these types of aeolian dunes. We can also get dunes in a submarine environment and instead of wind being the um, mechanism by which the sand grains move, we have a uh, flow of water. For fluvial rocks, uh, this uh, you could also say is rivers. We have two types of uh, river systems or two end members. We have braided river systems, and an example is uh, shown here, and meandering river systems where we get the sinuous uh, uh, gooseneck type of deposits. Uh, with the braided rivers, uh, almost all the stuff that's uh, tan here would be coarse clastics and good reservoir quality. For the meandering river, we see on the inside of a bend a big sandbar. Uh, this is called a point bar, and that would be a good quality reservoir rock. So a braided river is one that has channels that uh, uh, consist of a network of smaller channels and uh, islands that uh, are small and are temporary, they come and they go, and the river braids uh, through the main river valley. Um, there's an example here of the main river valley in the white, uh, and the deepest part of the uh, river is uh, this sinuous uh, line. Uh, we have some pools here and here, and we have some uh, bars or high uh, above um, water level um, islands here. And as the uh, water moves, if it's near the center of one of these, uh, these bends, uh, the highest velocity is towards the center of the channel. But where the river is uh, towards the left on this diagram, we have the higher velocity on the, uh, on the left where the deepest part of the river is on the right, we get the highest water velocities on the right. So uh, these things will deposit uh, 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 gravel, coarse sand, medium sand, and we'll get uh, uh, lateral bars and transverse bars, uh, very good uh, uh, possibility for reservoir quality rocks. 
The meandering uh, rivers, uh, meander is a bend in a sinuous river uh, and it forms as the water flows and it, er it erodes the, uh, the outside turns of the river and it deposits on the inside bends of the river. And we get uh, what are uh, referred to as point bars. So as the system evolves and gets more and more sinuous, we erode the inside of the bend I'm sorry, we erode the outside of the bend, we deposit uh, uh, material on the inside of the bend, and so these would be point bar deposits. Uh, and it's a, um, a representation of what a point bar would look like. Uh, it'll have an erosive base, uh, it'll have uh, gravel or conglomerates towards the base, and it will fine upwards into uh, coarse, medium, fine sands, and perhaps even into silt and into clay. Uh, the shoreline is where the ocean or the sea or the lake intersects the land, and we get a lot of uh, loose particles here. Waves and tides concentrate the coarsest size grains, uh, and it winnows out the finer grains, uh, silts and shales. And so uh, shoreline deposits can be well sorted, and uh, it will have a dominant grain size, and depending on uh, what's available, that might be fine sand, all the way up to cobbles. And then this is a diagram from the USGS about shoreline environments. Uh, it talks about offshore bar or illustrates offshore bars, the intertidal zone where uh, we have low to high tide, uh, the beach with a berm, and then we can have a, a barrier island and then go into a tidal marsh and uh, into a, a lagoon or a bay. Another uh, type of uh, reservoir quality rock is uh, where we have uh, river deltas. And a river delta is a landform at the mouth of a river. Uh, it's where the, the water and sediments coming down the river enter into the uh, sea and uh, suddenly slow down in their velocity, allowing material to be deposited. And over long periods of time, that uh, delta pattern will uh, migrate back and forth. So here is a, a picture of the uh, Mississippi Delta bird, bird foot delta uh, provided by uh, NASA. And if we look historically, that uh, Mississippi River Delta has been migrating back and forth and its current position is out in this position with the light uh, yellow. We get uh, three types of deltas depending on what the dominant force is. If tidal forces are the dominant uh, factor, then we get uh, channels and uh, the yellow would be the channel uh, sands uh, that get uh, somewhat uh, truncated uh, uh, evenly across. Uh, if we have a river dominated delta such as the Mississippi, uh, we'll get uh, a, a geomorphology like this with the bird foot delta. If waves is the dominant force, then we see sands that are smeared along the uh, shoreline. Uh, so the uh, rivers deliver it to the, uh, the swath zone and the uh, waves will uh, move the sand uh, laterally, uh, giving us a, a continuous sand body. Uh, this is an example of the Nile Delta in Egypt. And we can look at uh, some of the environments of deposition. We'll have delta plain that is uh, close to sea level. Uh, very seldom is it uh, covered by water except for an ex extremely large storm. We have the delta front, um, and that would be where we have uh, tides and waves and storms uh, reworking the sediment. We have the delta slope, which is uh, going from relatively shallow water out into the deeper basin and then we have basinal deposits. Uh, I'm going to put a cross section up now, A to A prime, as I go from delta plane to delta front to delta slope to basinal. And this is what uh, we might expect to see. So uh, delta plane and uh, delta front are at or close to sea level. And then we slope down into the basin, uh, get the delta slope, and then uh, eventually uh, further uh, basin where we get the uh, the darker green basinal types of deposits. 
This is a ex uh, seismic example. Uh, we'll look at this uh, in some of the future uh, units. Uh, this is from uh, offshore Australia. Uh, and you can see the uh, shapes is very similar. I'm going to go up a slide to the uh, uh, stratal geometries that we see here building up and out. And we see the same thing on the seismic where the uh, seismic is telling us we have depositions that's building up and building out. Uh, there is some um, geomorphologic terms that uh, we commonly use. Uh, this was first developed by Rich in 1951. Uh, he talks about the underform, that's uh, shallow water deposits of the shelf. Uh, an alternate way of expressing uh, the underform is to say they are top set beds. And then we have clinoform, which is deeper water uh, deposits of the uh, paleo slope. Uh, another way to express that is uh, four set beds. So that would be in this region. And then the third uh, geomorphic feature is the fondo form. That's the deepest water deposits out in the basin. And those are bottom set beds. And that would be in this part of this diagram. Another uh, geomorphic feature we see on uh, shelves in upper continental slopes are submarine canyons. These are steep sided valley cuts and uh, they can extend well onto the continental shelf and down the slope and uh, almost down to the, uh, uh, the abyssal plain. And these uh, canyons are typically cut during lower stands of sea and they provide conduits for getting coarser clastic materials, sands and gravels and even conglomerates out into a deep water environment. We can get uh, uh, deposits called uh, turbidites and a turbidite is a geologic deposit that is uh, laid down by a turbidity current. Uh, that's where we get uh, sediment uh, washed into a, a submarine canyon and uh, uh, it is uh, too steep of a gradient for it to, um, to uh, rest. And so it flows down uh, the slope within the canyon as a gravity flow. And we can get a lot of uh, clastic material, a lot of uh, coarser clastic materials out into the deep basin. Various uh, people have presented uh, models for uh, uh, deep water fan systems. Uh, Moody and Ricky Lucci um, published uh, uh, one of these models back in 72, and uh, this is based uh, largely on outcrops uh, in Europe. Uh, on the center part of the diagram is uh, representation of the stacking that we would see. Uh, within the turbidites, we tend to see the units are uh, getting uh, coarser upward and the sand layers are getting thicker. So we have uh, one period of uh, tur uh, turbidite flow, a second period of turbidite flow. And then if we get into a channel, we'll see an erosive base and a thinning upward uh, sequence of rocks. Within the uh, submarine fan uh, uh, and uh, canyon system, in the canyon system, uh, we're going to be primarily erosional downcutting and moving sediment. And as we get into the slope and the uh, abyssal plain, we'll be focused more on deposition. If we're in a channel system on the paleo slope, uh, as the sediment is moving down, we'll have a denser material um, uh, in the base of the, of, the, uh, of the canyon or the channel system, uh, a lot of sand uh, with uh, water. And uh, above that will be a cloud of lower density material, uh, a lot of water with a little uh, bit of uh, sand and, and mud. The low density material can go over the banks of the channel and uh, form uh, levees. The higher density material is going to continue down the slope through the canyon and get to the uh, abyssal, uh, uh, the continental rise or the abyssal plain and then it will form more of a sheet type of a sand deposit. Uh, this is an example from West Texas, an outcrop study by uh, Rick Boboff and his, uh, his uh, co-authors. Uh, 
the relic uh, shelf is up here. We have a canyon system here and another canyon system here. The shelf is a carbonate, but the material coming down the uh, canyons and being deposited on the abyssal plain uh, were clastics. And depending on where we look at the outcrops, uh, we can see uh, largely channelized deposits uh, getting more transitional and becoming eventually more sheet-like as we go from a region where the flows within the uh, turbidites are largely confined by the canyon or uh, uh, levee systems to unconfined uh, where they're able to spread out laterally. So we might have a map that we've uh, constructed from our seismic data. Uh, the pink here are represent, uh, representing uh, salt uh, bodies. Uh, there's an area where the salt is not present. present. Sediment can get from a mini basin that's shallower and flow through that neck into a deeper mini basin. And we may even on our uh, 3D seismic be able to see evidence for distributary channel systems. If I was to see something like this, uh, I have a depositional model where I have uh, canyons uh, uh, getting out to uh, the abyssal plain. I go from uh, highly confined flows to semi-confined flows to unconfined flows. The model says that where it's semi-confined, I might see this type of distribution of sands and stacking. Uh, the yellows would be the reservoir quality sands, the oranges would be uh, uh, either non-reservoir or poor reservoir. But if I'm further out where I think the flows are less confined and they're more sheet-like uh, sand deposits, then I would predict this type of distribution for the reservoir quality sands. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, types of carbonate environments that can lead to good uh, porosity and permeability and therefore uh, conventional reservoirs. Uh, here's uh, one of uh, hundreds of block diagrams of carbonate environments. Uh, we have a, 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 a refill uh, uh, shelf, uh, a slope and a basin. We have uh, ooids in, in shoals. Uh, we can have lagoons, we can have uh, patch reefs, uh, we can have uh, various types of uh, environments in which uh, uh, carbonates uh, are deposited. And some of the carbonate may be recrystallized to get dolostone or dolomite. Uh, here's a, a view of the Florida Keys. South Florida is a growing carbonate platform. We can look at uh, modern examples like uh, the Florida Keys. Uh, we can look at the Bahamas, we can look at the uh, uh, Great Barrier Reef off of Australia and understand uh, some of the different types of environments and where we might have rocks that would uh, have uh, good porosity and permeability and therefore be potential reservoirs. So with uh, carbonate porosity and permeability, uh, they can exist within limestones or dolomites. Uh, the primary porosity and permeability is that which is associated with the initial deposition, like the pore space between uh, carbonate ooid grains. Uh, secondary porosity and permeability is that which is associated with post-depositional diagenetic processes. And so we could have uh, carbonate dissolution. We could also have uh, carbonate cementation. Carbonate reservoirs are more problematic than clastic reservoirs because the post-depositional processes are more complex and uh, a bit harder to uh, predict and uh, quantify. So some of the carbonate di diagenetic processes increase porosity and permeability, and that makes us happy, but there are other processes uh, such as uh, uh, cementation that uh, decrease porosity and permeability uh, can almost uh, go down to zero. So uh, that's a quick view of some of the conventional reservoirs that we typically are searching for. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about unconventional reservoirs. And again, these are uh, reservoirs that have uh, lower uh, porosity and lower permeability than what conventional reservoirs have and it's only been the last uh, dozen years or so that we've been able to extract hydrocarbons
from these unconventional reservoirs and still make a profit. So this slide uh, talks about the transition from conventional reservoirs to unconventional. So the uh, uh, photo on the left is a high porosity, high permeability rock. Uh, porosity here is uh, 20 to 30 percent, uh, maybe up to 40. Uh, fluids can flow easily through this rock. Uh, in other words, it has good permeability. And we could put a well in here and get hundreds of barrels to thousands of barrels a day. Uh, intermediate uh, is this rock, which has a moderate porosity, 10 to 20 percent, moderate permeability. The flow that we would, might expect out of this type of rock is on the order of tens of barrels to hundreds of barrels per day. And then truly unconventional reservoir is something like the Marcellus Shale, uh, has ultra low porosity, 2% uh, up to maybe 10%, and it has ultra low permeability and fluids will not flow through these unconventional reservoirs naturally. Uh, we have to stimulate the rocks, uh, open up fractures so that the hydrocarbons uh, have a way to uh, get out of the rock and into the pipe and up to the surface. And with the unconventional reservoirs with processes such as uh, horizontal drilling and fracking, uh, we can get uh, tens to hundreds of barrels a day uh, of production. Uh, so here's a, another diagram. It talks about uh, photosynthesis and the uh, critters that die and collect on the seafloor form a source rock. Uh, it gets buried, it generates oil and gas. And then we have a couple of different conventional fields with conventional traps and reservoirs and seals uh, associated with faults and with the salt dome here and anaclines. But we also have unconventional fields where the hydrocarbons are produced from the uh, porous streaks after fracking within a source rock. So that's the um, conclusion of my prepared marks. Uh, this is the first of, I think, two pages uh, with references to some of the uh, images that I've uh, shown on the various slides. And uh, the second page of references, okay. So uh, we talked about reservoir rocks. Uh, next week, uh, we'll talk, or I'm sorry, uh, Thursday of this week, we'll talk about structure and traps. Uh, then we're gonna have a two week break, uh, no webinar on July 25 and 27, and the red arrow should have been up uh, uh, a line. And then in August, uh, we'll talk about uh, seals and migration and seismic interpretation, new ventures, uh, all the way down to 3D seismic interpretation. So with that, uh, I'm ready for questions and turn it back over to our lovely hostess, Danielle. Thank you, Fred. Um, we had a question come in from John Ijembe. Um, How can you tell from seismics that a carbonate reservoir is of good quality? What we would do with seismic is we'll try to understand what the um, depositional environment is uh, and uh, where um, in, in which uh, settings we might expect good porosity and permeability to develop. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in some of the future uh, uh, lectures. Um, we also have some more advanced geophysics that we can use where we can try to invert the seismic and get some of the uh, physical properties. But uh, it is uh, difficult to be uh, highly confident uh, with carbonates uh, where we're going to have uh, reservoir quality, porosity, and permeability. It's uh, one of the challenges that we still face. Okay. Patrick Taylor um, asks, what about the Athabasca tar sands? The Athabasca tar sands are up in Canada. Uh, they would be considered unconventional. Um, for uh, decades, we knew about the hydrocarbons in them, but we didn't have an economical way to extract the hydrocarbons. And uh, maybe in the last 15 years or so, they have been mining the uh, tar sands where they are, they are shallow, and they now have processes by which they can extract hydrocarbons uh, and still make some money. Uh, 
So uh, it's a pretty expensive uh, operation. Um, and um, depending on how prices for oil and gas uh, fluctuate, uh, sometimes they're making money and sometimes they're not. Great. So those were the only two questions that we had sent through. Um, okay. Oh, there's one more coming through from Norman Zeb. He asks, um, which sand deposits have more reservoir potential, channelized sands or sheet sands? That's a good question. Um, the channelized sands uh, can have um, a little bit of a um, mixture in uh, grain size, and sometimes that leads to better permeability, uh, especially if in the channelized sands uh, we have uh, gravel or even cobble uh, sized particles. Uh, the sheet sands tend to be more uniform in grain size, and so sometimes the uh, permeability is a little uh, less uh, than in some of the channelized deposits. But um, both, both the uh, sheet sands in deep water turbidites and uh, channelized sands on uh, paleo slopes uh, are uh, some of the primary reservoirs for uh, deep water Gulf of Mexico and uh, deep water offshore West Africa. Thanks, Fred. So, yep, um, there wasn't any more questions that came through after that. So, thank you so much for the webinar today, and we look forward to the one on Thursday. Okay, very good. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. All right. See y'all on Thursday and have a great day. All right. Bye, everyone.